because of my big legs and karate. I can do the splits, no problem. I know you like to look at yourself on television when you're six and a half a bitch. Don't do it. I saw the look in his eyes. This guy's crazy. He's fucking crazy. He's fucking crazy. Where are you from anywhere? Are you from France or Canada or a drink to that? No problem. <laughs> Jean-Claude Van Damme, girl! Now take your big stick and your boyfriend and find the best to catch. Yo! Welcome back to the Battle Van. Your mission this week, should you choose to accept it, is to listen to me and my actor pal Michael Benier discuss Steven Seagal's 1990 hit Marked for Death. Steven Seagal, I've always had an odd relationship with the man, mostly because he's so fucking ridiculous. I'm going to take you to the bank, Senator Trent. To the blood bank. The most ridiculous action star Ever, I would say. And that's an enormous, enormous statement. But Steven Seagal, what the fuck is he? What is he? He's like he's like a giant Native American, Jewish, Russian, uh, Japanese, white bread. I don't even know what the fuck he is. I mean, what is he? Does anyone know? He's the most confusing uh, amalgamation of a person ever. Now get your ugly white ass out of here. Don't come back. So let's just start out with some crazy-ass Seagal facts. First, when Seagal was 17, he moved to Japan and became the country's first non-Asian dojo master. So that's pretty big. I mean, Seagal's always had some sort of legitimacy in the martial arts. In fact, when I was a little little cherub, a little, a little fella, reading uh, Black Belt Magazine as a kid, I remember reading some article where, about how much Seagal and Van Damme my sworn hero and um, the main Otto Noy in my in my uh, in my world. He uh, Van Dam and Seagal hated each other. Maybe still do. And they used to kind of. I think they used to go back and forth, like challenging each other to fight. You know. And I was, I was like, oh, Seagal would get his ass whooped. I mean, he's kind of fat. Van Dam could do some crazy ass kick, but I don't know. I mean, Seagal seems like he has some super legit martial arts training. And if the sport was this popular perhaps 20 years ago, do you think you might have competed inside the octagon? Well, I wouldn't supposed, I was not supposed to do that, but I may have been a bad boy and done it. And he's also a fucking lunatic. Get this. Um, during the height of his career, according to the internet, my internet research, Seagal used to have a custom gun made for him every single month. Every month, he would have a custom gun made. How insane is that? I mean, just imagine the... Well, first of all, you gotta... Can you imagine just wanting a new gun every month? Like, every month, you're like, God, you know what I need in my life? A new gun. I need a new custom gun. He's got to stay on top of the orders. He's probably having to, like, you know, look at uh, blueprints. I don't know. That's That blew my mind. He also apparently has a very extensive sword collection. And um, this is fascinating. He not only is a citizen, somehow, of Serbia. I come back now to my village. I haven't been here one month. I've been traveling everywhere. Which is a country, apparently. He, uh, Stephen Skull, is a humongous musical star in Serbia. He does, uh, he does music. In fact, um, as I found out in the conversation you're about to hear, he um, co-wrote the main song of this movie, Marked for Death, with Jimmy Cliff, fucking huge reggae superstar. But I looked at some more of uh, Seagal's music online, and um, it's horrible. So I'll just leave it at that. You best believe that I'm here to stay because my God is better than your God. Some more facts. He's a vegetarian and a PETA honoree, which is surprising, but let's not forget 
he um you know he made a movie he made a few movies where he plays a, an environmental agent so you know he um you know that's apparently the environment he is on the right side of that which is um weird cuz he seems like I don't know. I guess maybe it's it's interesting. You know, how many people do you know who want a new gun every month, but are also like super vegetarian and into animals and protecting the earth? Kind of a cool little little combo there. That actually should not be so unusual, but it is. It seems like um, he also has his own Asian recipe inspired energy drink called Steven Seagal's Lightning Bolt. So definitely, you know, try to get some of that if you can. You know, if you're ever like thinking, man, I got to stay up to comb my sweet ponytail um, and, uh, you know, maybe fight some crime while being an environmental agent. How do I stay up? Steven Skull's lightning bolt. Get it. Get it done. Hey there. We want to tell you about Steven Seagal's new energy drink. It's called Lightning Bolt. It's 100% natural, and it tastes just great. In this movie in particular, Marked for Death, which is a fascinating film, and uh, me and my... Me and my guest, Michael Benier, who's he's an actor. He's been in like a million things. He's been in a movie with Chuck Norris, as I found out during this conversation. He's also in the, the Deadpool movie. He plays Warlord. Uh, he, you've, he's been in a million things. If you've ever seen a movie where they have like an over-the-top Arab villain or a TV show, he is that guy, even though he's um, Jewish. So it's an interesting thing in Hollywood. Uh, used to have much less strict casting criteria. But he's basically said Allah Akbar and blown himself up in about 500 different projects, even though uh, he's more used to saying Happy Hanukkah. Um, his sister in the film, Seagal's sister, was played by Elizabeth Ward Grayson, who had been Miss America in 1982. She is gorgeous. She is absolutely gorgeous. Um, stick around in the movie to, to, ch- to watch her. She's in like three scenes, but uh, she is beautiful and actually a pretty decent actress. Apparently, uh, according to trivia that I researched, she paid for acting classes with um, her Miss America winning. So pretty good. Uh, the film cost $12 million and made $57 million, which is like $100 million today. And at the time, I know Steven Skull is kind of a joke and a punchline. This motherfucker had five films in a row around this time that pr- that premiered at number one in the, in the box office. So fucking crazy. Another weird statistic about his movies. In his first six movies... Seagal's characters were in five bar fights. And there's a pretty good bar fight in this one. But how about that? Five out of six movies. You're going to see some bar fights. Or maybe, actually, I don't know. He just There's five bar fights in his first six movies. Maybe some of them had three. I, I don't really know. Um, apparently in this movie, Seagal was very particular about his wardrobe. And that's hilarious. Because in this movie, he dresses ridiculously. This is the weirdest costume selection movie I've ever seen for Seagal. At one point, he's wearing a uh, a scarf that's just sort of tied above it, like like high up on his neck. So there's like you can see skin beneath it, and he's and it's like this frilly scarf. It's like this it's like a giant sort of tie that he's wearing without a jacket. It's it's crazy. I mean, no one's ever. No one's ever in a million years worn that. And uh, but Seagal, you know, he was very particular about what he wanted to wear. And he was I guess he knew what the fuck he was doing because, um, you know, five and five number one movies in a row. So he knew stand out, stand out if, as much as you can. OK, how about this? I'll get down on my knees. Is this any better? One thing that's very clear, the more you research Seagal and we talk a lot about it a lot on this podcast, uh, in this episode he is a weird dude. He is a very, very weird dude. His whole ascent into Hollywood is weird. You know, he was. there's some more facts you're about to hear that Michael knew that I didn't even know. Um, and this is one of the, my favorite things I found out about Seagal. This is a story. Apparently, it's a widely circulated story in Hollywood. But apparently, one day, Seagal was on set. And an executive walked into his trailer and he found Seagal, Hollywood's number one reigning manly man, weeping. And Seagal held up a script and he said, oh my God, I've been reading this script. It's the most incredible script I've ever read. The executive said, that's fantastic. Who wrote it? Seagal didn't miss a beat. I did. So if that doesn't tell you about him, then... 
You're not paying very much attention. Here it comes. Marked for death. Talking to Michael Benier. Great actor. Whiny friend. Dear friend. Hilarious human being. And apparently uh, a guy who knows a fuckload about Steven Seagal. With 100% pure juice blends and is the only energy drink to contain Tibetan goji berries and Asian cordyceps. And it hits the spot every time. Now we can both swim in Steven Seagal's lightning bolt pool. Hi, uh, my name is Michael Benier. Uh, welcome to uh, Mo's I, podcast. I'll have already, I'll have already you, 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 I'm going to have a spiel before, okay, so I'll well, have already interviewed well, you. Well, I don't yeah. know what people know or don't know, but I'm an actor, and I, I started <laughs> acting in the late 80s, and what's really funny about Seagal is uh, the first movie was around 88, I guess, 80, 87, 88, uh, which was uh, Above the Law. And I remember going to the movie. I was given free tickets because a friend of mine worked in promo here in Vancouver. And I remember like, who is this guy? What is this guy? Right. And he had a high voice for an action. That's the right question. What is this guy? (laughs) What is this six foot five ponytailed soft voiced, like classically handsome, but also utterly ridiculous uh, judo guy? I mean, it's just crazy. It was it's weird. Cool. So if you knew the story at the time, uh, he was Mike Ovitz's, who was the super agent of the business at the time, his personal trainer, his his martial arts trainer. And he took a bet with someone and said, I can make anybody a star. And he gave him a three picture deal. And no fir- fucking way. Yes. And the word is the first one was above the law. So they kind of forced it. We're like, who is this guy? And if you look it up at the same time, there was a guy named Jeff Speakman. And Jeff Speakman they tried to make him a star right after him and it didn't work. But so the, so the first film was above the law. So a couple of years, maybe a year later, I go to Israel and I'm visiting with my cousins who live in a small town outside of Beersheba. And my cousin who was into martial arts, who's a couple of years younger than me, Daron, saying, hey man, we gotta go, <laughs> we gotta watch the illegal cable downstairs. We have a legal cable and there's a movie. You have to see this guy, Nico. This movie is called Nico. Nico. I go, I don't know Nico. I knew all movies. I don't know Nico. So finally he plays me the above the lot, which was called Nico in other territories around the world, <laughs> because that was his name. And he loved him. He just loved him. He thought he was the best, craziest thing. So at that time, I had started acting already. And I did MacGyver and stuff like that. I did a Friday the 13th movie. And then the first feature I did after Friday the 13th was a movie with Chuck Norris called The Hitman. Which was I know released. you told me that yesterday, and I was like, "Fuck, we no, should have no, done it's that." Better, one. It's better this way. It's better this way. So, um, I thought I'd seen all of the Seagal films because I because I had done the Hitman in 1990. I was inspired to write a script, an action script, an action script, which I wrote. I, ha- I oh, found it. Fuck yeah! Can you walk us through that? Okay, like what is so, the plot? It's actually such a good plot that I'm not going to tell it on the thing. I'm not kidding. Uh, I'm not kidding. We'll talk about what, it off off the record. What? What? Just at least tell us what genre it is. It's what genre of action? It's a vehicle for for Seagal or for Norris. It was like late '80s, early '90s. Kind of everything is at night. You know, uh, wet wetted down streets. You know, he's against all the different ethnicities. And I remember doing in street. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Because what you just said is like one of those weird things that you're right. It's like in each of these movies, they usually pick one ethnicity and it's just a white dude like, yeah, da, 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 da. <laughs> like taking out like every Afghani or every right. Bri- you're, you're reminding me this. We're going. I don't get we're just I don't know what your podcast is, yeah, but this is hilarious. Around about is it. around that time. I was interested in writing these movies and I remember renting Rambo three. OK, which was Rambo against. Just yeah. watched it. I just no, but he wasn't Rambo against the Afghanis. It was Rambo against the Russians, Russians but he was with the, the Afghanis, right? So yeah. he's in the Middle East. Okay. So my father, who had been in the Israeli military for three years, he was an MP, comes to watch. The, he comes into the room where I've I've got my VHS player, and he starts watching it, and he goes, "That would never happen." He goes, "That would happen. That would never happen. That could happen." Right. And the movie that I had watched just before it, where he came in was Point Break. Okay. So remember Point Break? They go in there at the gas station and they one use one of my the, absolute favorite movies. When they, they use the um the nozzle of the gas pump as a flamethrower. Okay. My father goes, That would never happen. They would they would blow themselves up immediately. But then we start watching Rambo Three with Stallone, and he does the sequence where he's checking for um mines in the sand by stabbing it with his knife. 
And he goes, yes, that is correct. Yes, that's why correct. Did your, why did your dad know about that? My father had been in the Israeli military. He knew oh. how everything worked. My dad was that's, in That's kind of cool. Yeah. Well, it's so fascinating to watch Rambo 3 because they basically make the Taliban or the Mohajanin, like into, they're like the heroes of the movie, basically. They're like, yes, these are the great Mohajanin warriors, and they're the ones who help Rambo overtake the Russians and then flash forward like 25 years or like our sworn enemies or whatever. Exactly. At that time, they were the heroes. We were helping them. They were the freedom fighters. All right, here I am. I'm looking up above the law. Yeah, Nico Toscani. Let's just go through the Seagal names real quick, all right? Okay. We begin with Above the Law, which, oddly enough, was made by Arnold Copelson, and he went on to make Platoon. So Actually, Platoon of- was made prior to our Above the Law. Sorry. Uh, I remember okay. because I met Johnny Depp in 87 on my first job on 21 Jump Street, and he had just filmed that movie. 86. That's 87. right. That's right. Okay. But still, he is a very, you know, he just died recently. Actually, He's an A-list my, movie producer, for sure. My mom went was best friends in high school with Arnold Copelson's wife, Ann Copelson, who I'm, also produced the movie. I believe it. Yeah. Unfortunately, they didn't have like, they still don't have a really great relationship. So, you know, I was never really able to get any hookups out of that. But uh, <laughs> all right, here are the names. Okay. Nico Toscani. Yeah. Then we come to Hard to Kill, Mason Storm. Nice. Out for justice. Detective Gino Fellino. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Under siege, Casey Ryback. Okay. This one's great. On Deadly Ground, Forrest Taft. That's when he wanted to be a Native American. That was the Native American. No. Well, on Deadly Ground, okay, Deadly Ground, the, the description for Deadly Ground is truly amazing. Let's just go through the descriptions here, right? Yeah. Deadly Ground, a mystical martial artist slash environmental agent. Yes. Takes on a ruthless oil company. No, I remember this clearly. This is when he went with his Native American uh, um, imagery and his his character became Native American. He also performed music uh, on Saturday Night Live with a band doing kind of music for the movie. Also, he did a song with um, what's the reggae guy in the movie we just saw? He, at the end of the movie, that song was co-written by Seagal. You're fucking kidding me. Come on, really? do, some, do some research, Mo, before we do uh, this. Come on. I don't have to because you apparently know everything. Yeah. Uh, how, how about this one? The movie's called Half Past Dest. Half Past Dead, he plays Sasha Petrovich. Okay. This movie tells the story of a man who goes undercover in a high-tech prison to find out information to help prosecute those who killed his wife. While there, he stumbles onto a plot involving a death row inmate and his $200 million stash of gold. Now, listen, you can go through 30 years of movies and find various name, character names. Now, I didn't tell you this. And I know you're drinking now. I'm just, I don't want you to spit up the drink. I was offered a role in a Seagal movie about five, six years ago. God damn it. Why did you not take it? Um, I auditioned for a bigger part and I wanted the bigger part. And then they offered me the smaller part, which was two days. And I would have had scenes where Seagal breaks my leg. And because oh. I knew, because I knew his arm, my arm actually, and I knew that he was very like kind of hot under the collar and would just do random things on set. I didn't want to do the set, the scene and get potentially hurt by Seagal for this scene I didn't want to do. God, you're such a pussy. I am. You could have had your scene. <clears throat> Dude, because that is Seagal's, I mean, we, we'll get into this movie in particular, but he, how many guys' arms does he break in this movie? He's constantly, right. like, right. grabbing guys' arms and snapping them. Right. All right, so it's let's get through this movie. So it starts out with him in Mexico or somewhere. He's an, uh, undercover, and he basically accidentally shoots a woman. Right. Who was trying to shoot him, and that that that's sort of like... That's the moment he realizes he's gone too far. Yeah. He needs to re-examine his life. Sure. Have you ever had one of those moments where you did something really dark and you just had to really, really look at yourself and think, this isn't the Michael Benier I've always wanted to be? Every time we would go for lunch, Mo. Every time. Every time me and you go for lunch? Yeah. No, but seriously, did you ever, did you ever do anything like, did you, did you, ever, t- you ever get mad and do something too far? And you know you what? Ever- Can I, do we have time to tell a little mini anecdote? I mean, it's a podcast. So okay, so you just cut it out. Talk it sucks, right? Okay. So basically, when I was 17, I started acting, and I was really getting into it. And then one day, I had an audition for 21 Jump Street. There were like two or three in a row, and it was to be a teen gang member. So I asked my buddy if I could can I, just, borrow- can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah. That's how fucking pussy Vancouver was in the 80s, that you were the choice for a teen gang member. 
Well, I have olive complexion, and there was nobody else <laughs> other than I me. I know. Right? That's what I'm saying. Okay. Like, that dark-skinned Jewish kid will be perfect for this gang I, I, scene. I did look pretty gang member if you look me up there on that that time. No, you didn't. You look like you're in some sort of terrible teenage rock band. No, no, no. You look at look at me in the Friday the 13th. I had the bandana and the whole thing. Uh, yeah, I know. I've seen that. That was pretty okay. good. That was pretty okay, good. so anyway, I asked my buddy if I could borrow a plastic gun. He goes, yeah, let me just finish working here at the cookie store. And come back and we'll go together and play mini golf. So I went to his house because I knew how to get into the house. And I came back to that area where there were pedestrians walking around, kind of like Larchmont, if you will. And I'm walking around with my long hair and a plastic gun. And people started to think that it was a real plastic gun. And I thought this was hilarious. Because you're too olive to have white privilege. Didn't really think about it then. Okay. Right. Did white, did white privilege exist in the 80s? It's, it's existed until today even. But at this oh, right. point, there was no we 9-11 just, at this point. But we okay? didn't know what we didn't even know what white privilege was back then. We were just kind of enjoying the perks right, of it. Right. So I see it. him and I, my friend, other friend, Ben, is waiting to drive the car. And I go in. I say, John, all the people around here think this is a real plastic gun. Let's pretend that you're oh my, my hostage, <laughs> that you're my hostage. He goes, sure. Great idea. I literally take him like this and in the movies and drag him across the street holding the gun to his head, yelling at everybody, I'm going to kill you all. I'm going to kill all of you. We think it's hilarious. We get into the car, we pull away, and gravel spills everywhere. And I see about 20 people huddled, huddled under a doorway looking at us. And, we're, and I yell, roll down the window on the back seat. I'm going to kill you all. I'm going to kill all of you. Ha, ha, ha. And we start barreling down the road. And then people are flashing their lights at us as though, uh, you know, to put your seatbelt on. And we do that. And I'm like, wait a second. And as we kind of crest over the hill, we see six-car police blockade. And gun, guys behind their cars. No in- way. How have I been friends with you for 15 years or whatever? I've heard every one of your dumb stories, and I've never heard this incredible one. Yeah, this is true. So um, then they say, by the way, you can hear the sirens in the background. It's getting picked still up. It's after amazing. You. They're still it's after amazing. You, it's amazing. And people, if you shouldn't have said that, people would have thought, man, he's really putting some production value in it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I didn't want to think people to think we're gilding the lily here. So they say, uh, you know, license plate, whatever it is, pull over, uh, come out of the vehicle with your hands got up. Do any of you gentlemen have a handgun? And I remember saying, uh, it, it's plastic, sir. He said, what? And I said, it's plastic. He goes, break a breaker. He goes, it's a bunch of bonehead teenagers with a plastic gun. Right. And I was so <laughs> freaking stressed after this. He called you bonehead. Yeah. Bonehead teenagers. Yeah. And, and, and did anything happen? Well, they were the people. They wanted to know if they wanted to press uh, mischief charges. The people and they. We waited a few minutes, and in that time, one of our friends' moms drove by and saw us with the cops. It was crazy. Okay, and then I was so humiliated, and my friends just took it easy. And I and I was like, and he said, and I said, I was going to throw the plastic gun out the window when we were coming over. He goes, Had you brought the gun to the window, I would have shot you in the head. And that was oh the moment God. where I was like. Okay, and I did not go to play golf after that. I was so shaken up after that. Wow, so, that's a good. That is a really good story, man. Huh? Now, did your mom's friend? Did your friend's mom stop and get involved? Yeah, she came over and the whole thing. But they were. What waiting. happened to my Jeremy? What happened to Jeremy? Right, right. Did he? What happened? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it was Ben, and uh, yeah. no, it was Ben. Okay, yeah. So, all right, so that's a pretty interesting. So you you could probably really relate to the beginning part of this film. You know, sure. Because uh, yes, it was you've been there. Yeah, it was like that kind of. Yeah, I, I thought what was very interesting is, you know, after he has this dark moment, he quits the force and he goes home. And uh, essentially, it seems like Seagal had not been home since he was in high school. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Is that I was very to confused? Be, sorry, about was that. that his sister's home or his mother's home? It seemed like that's where he grew up because he no. went into his old then childhood he, no, room. But, but why did the little girl answer? the door and then it was a birthday party of sorts and then her mother which is his sister okay was there okay yeah and then he meets the dad in the backyard so they all live there or maybe her sister I, it wasn't I was, clear it also seemed like he kind of wanted to fuck his mom i don't know if you got that vibe i know you're living with your mom now during this coronavirus but but, but that was supposed to be his mother that's what i could that's why did he I refer could think to of? her by first name i don't know no that was not his to, mother he's trying that to was hit not his i don't know and by the way, he embraced his sister so much. And if you notice, they covered an ADR to clarify, sis, it's good to see you. Where he hugged her and they didn't say that. He's good to see you, sis. Yeah. Right. Because they were like, there's too much sexual chemistry. Yeah, there was. Gotta... There was. Yeah. 
Also, can we just stop when he comes to the house and he opens the door, the little girl goes, he, she goes, who are you? And he goes, I'm your uncle. Right. And she goes, no, you're not. My uncle lives far away. He goes, right. I did live far away. Now I'm back. She's like, okay, come in. Right. I'm like, this is no kids. No. She was away that day at school where they tell you to not yeah. talk to strangers. Yeah. I mean, a, a lot. I mean, and also a large man with a high pitched voice and a ponytail <laughs> who claims to be your uncle. That's not who you want to let into your house. No, no. So he comes back. He, he readjusts. You no, but know, I love that uh, scene in the room, though, like you're saying. Like, his room is unchanged since he came back from Vietnam. Which makes me, but I didn't understand. I'm like, <laughs> just because he was working in the force, what that meant. I guess because he was undercover for a while. That, But he, that's why he hadn't seen his family and it seemed like 30 years. It was No, unclear. the little girl knew that she was the uncle. So maybe in the last several years, she was 10 or 11. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Still seemed weird. It always seems weird to me in movies where a guy just shows up and you're like, they had phones. Yeah. By the way, like, why didn't you call Seagal? Like, what are you doing? You're like doing like judo. You just, you can't just call. You listen, man, I know you're a lot younger than me, but these are the days where long distance was expensive. Um, oh, people, you're right. And he, he had just quit the force. People so he didn't was trying have to Skype pinch. calls like this. All they right. didn't have video conferencing. You know, it was a different time. Different time. Right. Okay, so he's back, right? So he starts getting he starts getting to know the town again. Yeah, he runs into his old friend, um, who's played by Keith David. Keith David, love it. We're, I work with him in a movie. Amazing. Tell me about. Okay, I love Keith David. He's I only really know him from comedies for the most part. Well, Keith David, a number one is an amazing film and television actor, but his voiceover career is one of the biggest. He's he's one of the biggest. He does the army commercials. That's him, you know. Like I didn't know that. so we did a movie together, a little a picture called The Chronicles of Riddick. Oh, I love I love that movie. You were in that movie. I'm in that movie and I'm not given billing because they cut me out at one point and then put me <laughs> back in. But we have a scene. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. That doesn't that's not fair. Because they cut you out and put you back in. You know, because like I believe credited? I'm in the director's cut on home video. I, I don't know. But I've uh, I've I'm seen really it. talking. I didn't know I was talking to such an action star. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who did who did you play? Vin Vince uh Vin Diesel's bald double? I actually play Meccan Man. That was a whole movie unto itself, story unto itself. So, and by the way, an extra in that movie with me, the two days that I worked, the one day I worked of the two I was supposed to work, was a girl named uh, Nicole Lilly, who was an extra. Six months later, she had an acting career. She was the star of Lost, Evangeline Lilly. Wow. Yeah. Crazy, man. So uh, Keith David were there, and I said to him, hey, you know, I'm such a fan. And I go, did you do this? And he goes, I really don't know. Like he did so much voiceover, he had no idea what he had done in the past. Like he was like, "Oh yeah, know. Keith David wasn't he like the president in the Chronicles of Riddick or something?" He played this imam, his friend on this planet. That's why I was a scene. Yeah, with he him. was like a spiritual spiritual yeah, guy or something. Yeah, yeah. So he comes back. He sees Keith. David. Yeah. So Keith David is now the football coach, and it's the same thing. Where like you know, Seagal comes back, and Keith David essentially hasn't seen him since they were in high school, and. And uh, you know Keith David's been dealing with some shit. Actually, let's find out what's his real what's his name in the movie. I want to be able to call him by. Why we got to call him Keith David? Well, he wants All to right, get a gig. Keith David. This. All yeah. right, so anyway, he he he. You know things are going well in his life. Although one of his star football players overdosed on cocaine the night before. And while they're having this, or like the year before, and while they're having this conversation, there's this great scene where these these. Uh, it's just so classic, politically incorrect here, where these white kids are just sitting there, and then these black kids just come up and go. You got to try some weed, man. Yeah. You amazing. got to try some weed. I mean, it was like considering what was going on. I mean, they were not even kids. They were like Jamaican men who were just hanging around the high school. They were not kids. They were drug dealers. They were they drug had, dealers. And they had such thick Jamaican accents that I was like, I don't even know what they're saying. Dude, I will say that for the movie, though. I mean, I having <laughs> lived in the Caribbean for like six months at one yes. point. Those accents seem pretty good, and they were too good. I they couldn't understand what the fuck good. anybody was so, saying. Okay, yeah. I'm looking at it up right now. Uh, Keith David's character name was named Max. Now- and, I, and this is so random. So when I watched the movie, I watched it and then I was like, oh my God, I've worked with that person. I've worked with that person. I've worked with that person. And I'm looking at the credits and a guy I've known over 30 years who is an LA actor who moved to Canada, Phil Tanzini, is listed as uh, t kid number two in that scene. So, <laughs> so I go back and I'm like, who is he? And he doesn't say anything. He's in the background of where the kid goes, is this crack? Right? Yeah, okay. yeah. And he goes, yeah, man, it's a crack. You got to smoke the crack. This is whatever, right? Also, you, when do you ever hear someone with a Jamaican accent talking about crack? No, because that was what was hot in 1990. That was the big I know, fear. but what I thought was amazing, I mean, A, it was totally politically incorrect because they had like the most like adorable little waspy white kids and then these black kids are just like, you got to do 
crack and cocaine and smoke a weed. It was just like, oh, yeah, yeah. And then also what was hilarious was it, you really saw the theory of marijuana being a gateway drug all in one scene. It's like, first they're smoking weed, and he goes, if you like that, you got to try this. And they're like, it is was, this crack? It was in two seconds. He literally yeah. did one puff. It was goes, the you most like of, that? You, you, yeah. Yeah, because, it was a because immediate probably, gateway drug. You, you you can just see the, 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 the story meeting, which is, well, Jamaicans would be selling weed. Yeah, but that's not that dangerous. We got to get them to do crack. Well, how, would, how about we do that scene, which is, if you like marijuana, you're going to like crack. Okay. But also, speaking of story meetings, I mean, the Jamaican thing could not have been an accident. Didn't reggae really get big in America in like the early to mid eighties? Yes. Well, I did a little research. I know, I know that you didn't. And the the screen. We might have to make this a co-host situation, man, because you you seem to have a lot of good research here okay. that I have not done. So the so so the guy who wrote the movie said it was inspired when he read an article about how Jamaican gangs had been making inroads into American drug dealing. So that when inspired. Did, when did that happen? I feel well, like I, I guess in that. the mid '80s, which is when he probably wrote the script and it was kicking around. So he does this, but I loved it because at the time they were looking for new, like a new take, a new flavor of the action movie. How would they do it? Like when we t- when we talked about this on the phone, I mean the the whole joke at the time was Seagal's movies all had the same kind of generic names: Hard to Kill, Above the Law, Mask, Mark for Dead, all these things. And how do we separate them later? And then you said to me, it's the Jamaican one. I went, of course. Now, back yeah. to my point was, I thought I'd seen this film, but I'd never seen it. Because in 1990, he had two movies. This movie opened at number one, this movie we're watching right now. Look, I'll be honest, it was not a bad movie. I enjoyed this movie. Like, I'm going to explain to you, because the movie that I saw before it, which was the one, I believe, in Brooklyn, which is a great film, actually. It's, a, it's like the mafia one. Okay. Is, oh, I have a feeling I know what his name was in that. Okay, yeah. I think I that's the Italian name. name. Was- yeah, yeah. Lino Valino. <laughs> okay, that one was a big hit. So then they gave extra money to this budget. They gave uh. him more money because he had already opened at that point. Wow. Right. So they added like explosions and like you know more kills. There's lots of kills in this movie. So um, regarding the Jamaican aspect, which was it was something new. We had not seen anything. And then if you look around, the same time there was another film can't remember the name of it at the same time that it came out, which also had Jamaican villains. Yeah, you know, that's what I'm saying. Because Reg- reggae music and dancehall goes in like 10-year cycles in America. Like, we get into reggae music for like, like we're into Bob Marley, then we, we get into Shaggy, then we get into Sean Paul, and now we're probably due for a good, like, Jamaican culture interest here. Right, um, which reminds it, me, in that drug scene, the opening scene where they give the kid the, the yeah. marijuana, the guy... <laughs> You got to watch it again. So the Jamaican guy goes, don't worry, be happy. That song had been number one oh, that year. I couldn't fucking believe that when he quotes the Bobby McFerrin song. Don't worry, be happy. I know <laughs> when I see that thing, when I saw that, I'm like, oh, this is going to be like the most poorly done Jamaican representation. And it kind of was, although, well, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. When they go to Jamaica, actually, I thought it was, I don't know. I've never been to Jamaica, but it seemed seemed like Jamaica. Okay, so let's give a shout out to the, the I don't know most of the actors in the film. But uh, who played the Jamaicans? But the guy who is the main villain, Screwface, was fantastic. Okay. He was really good. Okay, 100%. his first now, hold on, role. Hold on. Before I in- let me interrupt you here. This is something I'm noticing with these films. The villains are often really good actors. Yes, the heroes are horrific actors. I mean, the acting in this movie is so unbelievably bad. It's only his like fourth movie, Seagal, and I don't know that he ever really mastered the craft. But it, there's some lines in here. There's one line I try to find it where he says like. Damn it, Gino! No, come on! Or something. It's just like it's really bad. It's really, really bad. We gotta, you gotta line that 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 clip up. So, but Screwface, the main Jamaican villain. Yeah, tell us. So I look it up, really good. and I look. I'm like, yeah. I never seen this. Who is this guy? So he has like like green eyes in the movie, or something kind of, which must have been done extra for the movie, right? So I'm like, he, this is his first credit. So I'm like, and they're like, this is his first movie. And then I look it up. He had been like a theater actor in New York for years. I believe he was born or his parents from from Jamaica, theater actor in New York. He went to Yale. Like he's a fucking classically trained now, actor. You could tell he was great. Like he was like, and he was great. And he had a lot of flair and like, yeah. But right. here, okay, so we'll get into it. So he Seagal basically realizes there's this Jamaican crime element. He, he doesn't want to get involved. Well, you don't have to worry about that because- as much as he resisted, they pulled him back he in. Couldn't he couldn't stop? No, that's often yeah. And it was purely by luck, you know. He goes to the bar, 
And it turns out some uh, incredibly heavy accented Colombians yeah. are doing a drug deal. But don't with forget, these- but don't forget, they got to get in the gratuitous nudity of the strippers. And then there was the girl who was doing the voodoo. And she kind of did. No, the- no, we're coming up on the voodoo. Oh, we're coming up on the voodoo. Love it. Yeah, yeah. You're right. There's always a gr- gratuitous strip club. But this, I was saying to Ashley, uh, my fiance, for anyone listening, after this movie, I'm like, this was probably the most gratuitous nudity scene I've ever seen. So anyway, shootout erupts between the the Jamaicans and the Colombians. And uh, and you, you see there's some beef there. But the Colombian guy, you know, whatever. They're, they're going to. So there's this moment where the Colombians and the Jamaicans clearly want to go at each other. They have this meeting, and then they each go off, and they go to their respective shaman voodoo kind of entities. I mean, it seems completely racist and kind of just weird and just an odd semi-racist element of this movie that they're both kind of like going to these sort of witch doctors. So the Jamaican guy, yeah, he's doing all kind of like voodoo, which I think is Haitian, and I know it's Haitian. I don't think it has anything to do with Jamaica. But um, then the Colombian guy goes to this sort of, I don't know what you would call like a fortune teller. Yeah. That's Santeria. For, That's Santeria. Oh, yeah, Santeria. And for no reason at all, when they do this montage of her doing the uh, the Santeria thing, yeah. she pours, <laughs> she gets into the bathtub naked for no reason. Right. And then just pours, uh, like, milk all over her breasts or something. Yeah. And, and then slices a chicken's head off. But you're watching it, you're like, what the fuck is going on? She, she <laughs> I love how she holds the chicken up, and then yeah. they show that she's got the blade, and then they cut to this blood spurt onto the Jamaican drug dealer's face because they're going to put a voodoo on him, the hex on right. him. But first, before you do that, you got to get them titty, the, you know, you got to get them titties nice and yes, wet. for sure. Into a, for yeah. sure. It didn't work. It worked uh, a little too well. No, it didn't work. The The Jamaicans killed her instead of... No, no, but killed. they must have known that she was doing something. Right, they figured it out, yeah. yeah. So anyway, whatever. Seagal gets involved. And then it, then they do a classic thing where there's a drive-by shooting and his little daughter who has, you know, he met at the door and was stupid enough to let him in. She ends up in like a coma. And now it basically becomes Seagal against the Jamaicans. And uh, that's when it really got good. That's when I kind of shifted closer in my in my uh, on my couch for sure. Yeah. I, and, and for some reason, and I and, God, I didn't understand this element His he wasn't a cop anymore. No. But he's able to just go around shooting people like crazy. But no, but and then, then they, get- they introduced um, Kevin Dunn, who was the local detective on it. Yeah. Okay. He gets involved at the end. No, Kevin Dunn comes in. He's like, hey, man, I know you. You shouldn't be doing this. Get out of here. And then they right. also showed Joanna Pacula, who I did a movie with, a terrible, terrible movie. So she was kind of the foreign uh, accented. What was she supposed to be? Oh, she was like a journalist. She was the one who had been tracking down the Jamaican. Right, so, right. Okay. But here's another great thing. And I mean, I, I keep saying this every podcast, but another attractive woman who kind of comes into our, our heroes lives and he doesn't smash like there's there for some reason he doesn't have sex with her. No, like what's the- that? That is a trope. It is done on purpose, which is that that women viewers will like him more. That, because that's he doesn't un- sleep with the women, really? Because he's unattainable. They like that. And by the way, I love the introduction of her where she sees him and he kind of gives her a look. And then she says to something, he goes, he's off the force. She goes, he looks like he's in, she with her accent, he looks like he's in good formation or whatever the fuck she, she says. Oh, is that what she said? I couldn't understand what she said. That was at that point in the movie, I'm like, what the fuck is all these accents? I can't understand anybody in this movie. <laughs> by the but way, she's that- a fantastic actress who was in uh-huh. a movie called Gorky Park in 1983. And because of that, she has a career in Hollywood. But she go went lower and lower in a, B movies, C movies. I did a D movie with her in like, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago. But she is a called? great actor. It was called, you know what? We're not going to talk about it because that one is so bad that you will not believe it, actually. All right. Well, again, I'm going to get it for you. After it's, called, it's called oh. Crash and Burns. Anyway, move on. Crash and Burns. <laughs> Let's not skip over the sweater that he's wearing when she sees him. Yeah. He is wearing a sweater. This is his first night out of the town. There's two, there's like a dragon lion on one side and then like another dragon lion on the other. And then you're like, that's the worst sweater I've ever seen. And then he turns around. There's just like a massive dragon lion on the back. He hits you with the one, hits you with the other. And then that third one really fucking comes for it. You got to remember in 1989, you know, sweater was big, big. But not that. Seagal always, like, there's another scene in this movie where he turns around and he's wearing. I'm trying to find, playing? I'm trying to pick up the, 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 yeah, it won't work. Go on. Yeah, no. no, it won't work over the recording. But there's one point where he turns around and he's wearing a scarf 
but it's not like a scarf that's like tightly around his neck. He's wearing it like a like a tie almost. So it's above like you see like his bare neck. And then there's like this weird scarf tie. I don't know. It's fucking crazy. But so you're really anyway, into the the, the the fashion details of these. No, movies. well, because Seagal is so weird. And the way he dresses in this movie is so weird. And the way he runs is so weird that when you're watching it, you're like, why is this guy? I mean, this is this to me looks like like if you were like if this movie were a pilot, right? These are all the things you would look at after the pilot's done and be like, all right, when we go to series. Let's recast. Uh, let's teach if we go with this guy, let's teach him how to run. Let's definitely not have him wear that scarf. And how many lines does one sweater need? You know what I mean? And also these Jamaican accents are way too strong. I can't understand what any of these fucking guys are saying. Right. You're completely right. But they didn't. Instead, Seagal, he's still making movies. Actually, matter of fact, he's most recent movie uh, above the law too, with Nico Toscani just announced. How what? about that? Are you joking? Yeah, I'm not kidding. That's From the 19- sequel to the original movie. That's amazing. Yeah, dude. Let's see who the producers are on this one. Steven Seagal right. and Steven Seagal. Yeah, By the way, can we address the fact that Steven Seagal, who is clearly a nice Jewish boy from New Jersey. What? Come on. Seagal? Steven Seagal's not Jewish. Yeah. Look it up. I don't believe that. He's a he's a tall Jew. No. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he doesn't look Jewish. And by the way, he is tall. And I will tell you, Keith David, I'm six feet tall. Keith David was taller than me. And they look around the same height. In the film, and that's why I believe Keith David was hired. And let's discuss. L- the look, fact- look it up. Hold on. Look it up if he's Jewish. I don't believe this. I think Steven Seagal. His father is of Russian Jewish descent. I looked it up today. Gee, man, can you come on this podcast full time? You're really doing a lot of research here. Okay, um, so basically, what happens is the woman that's attractive that likes him that he doesn't sleep with for no uh, reason, really. She basically tells him, "You gotta have to go to Jamaica and kill that guy because he's fled to Jamaica and." If, unless you go kill him, they're never going to stop and they're going to kill you. But if you can kill him, the other Jamaicans will realize you have the power and they, they think he's like a god. They think he's like Kim Jong-il or Un over there in North Korea. What are we on? Un or Il at this point? I always get confused. We got it. Kim Jong. Kim Jong, that guy. Uh, the way that everyone thinks he's like a god over there, they think that of the Jamaican guy screw face. So you got to go cut his head off, basically, and show and kill him. So... So then you got this great pat. All right, you got this great mission to Jamaica. So before before uh, we move ahead, Ben, you're yeah, you know, because for this whole second half of the movie, basically, or second or last third, they go to Jamaica. I want to ask you some some questions here. Now, what would it take? And you can you can take your time to answer this. Yeah. What would it take for you? Yeah. To travel to Jamaica to fight a Jamaican gang. And. Who would be the two guys you bring with you? Now, in this movie, Seagal obviously brings Keith David and then the Jamaican cop who's been tracking him down. What would it take for you to get on a plane with all your guns after a long montage scene like we saw in this movie, loading them up, go to Jamaica, and go to war with the Jamaican gang? Let's start with that, and then we'll get into your your cohorts. Well, clearly, it would be the result of me going back to stay at my childhood home where my sister, who's divorced, lives with my niece— and them getting killed in the crossfire or shot and is in the in the hospital, you know, on life support. That would do it. I, it makes it personal. It's a personal but, vengeance. But, but, would, but I understand how that worked in this movie. But you personally. <clears throat> yeah. So you don't have a niece or a nephew. You've got David. David, who is my cousin. If that would happen, Your cousin, I would do who, it. I don't believe it. <clears throat> David, let's look at him, right? He's 23. He's 21. He's, yep. He's 21. He's in a band. Yeah. You're telling me if David got shot right now and God ended up forbid. in a coma. Yeah. God forbid. You would get on a plane from Vancouver. Yeah. Fly to Jamaica and go to war with the Jamaican street gang. Yeah. You tell me that <laughs> I'm you saying swear if, on your if, father. Swear on your father. I want I'm curious if you would actually do it. I was saying if I was trained oh, in okay. the art of combat and a formal former special forces and karate master as Steven Seagal is in all his films, for sure. Okay. What else am I have these gifts for? For sure. That's a good point. I mean, you have been in a lot of action movies. Yes. I don't feel like that gives you the skills that you would need. I, I could d- I could definitely fake it. Yeah. Okay. So who are you bringing with you on that mission? Are we talking real people or our movie uh, commandos? No, no, I'm talking people in your life. Like, you can bring two people. Oh, well, we, we, know. We, we both know. We're going to say it at the count of three. Number one, who I'm going to bring. Turbo. You ready? <laughs> Turbo. One, two, three. Claude. I'm going to bring Claude with me. Okay. Okay. Claude is our wild 
French Canadian friend who would probably be like, "Oh yeah, I mean, I mean that sounds great, man. I, mean, I know this guy who's a roadie over there. We could probably stay in the <laughs> this hostel for free, man. Yeah, it's good." I would definitely. By the way, Claude him- has the keys to my apartment right now while I'm out of town. It makes me very uncomfortable. All right, keep listen. Going. So he's, Claude, he's, he's okay. All right. I don't think you, I think Claude is the worst of your worries right now in in, in L.A. There, there's rioting going on. The National Guard is on Hollywood and Highland right now. I know. Claude's probably renting out my apartment to fucking homeless people who want to get off the street. <laughs> totally. Uh, so, okay. So you bring Claude. Yeah. Who else are you bringing? Um, because I'm going to Jamaica, I would bring yeah. someone that would blend in just like they did in the movie. Well, that's not why they brought that. Well, that's not why I brought Keith well, David. That the was like the reason friend. they brought them in the movie is that you cannot have a, a a movie filled with black villains without having black heroes. Right. Of course. So you course, have a yeah. black best friend, which is Keith David, and you have yeah. the Jamaican. By the way, that guy's an excellent actor. He's not Jamaican. I've seen him in a million things. I yeah, I've seen him a lot of things, too. I will say I was impressed for 19, whatever, 87 or whatever. 1990. 1990. 1990. I was impressed they were already politically correct to know that if you're going to have a movie where a white guy kills a bunch of black dudes, you have to have. Some like two heroic black dudes are also, you know. They always knew that. They always. I don't knew know that. if they knew that. Really. Even even in in True Lies, which was the next year, they had Grant Heslov playing the the good Arab computer hacker helping him. Oh, yeah, you got to show the you know. But here's the thing that I did like about it: the Jamaican guys, while they were the villains, like the black dudes were the villains. They didn't seem like bad guys. They were just well, like drug dealers. Which is really you know? thank you just, so much for sh- pointing this out. So there was about five or six guys. One was called Monkey. I got from the name. One was called Monkey. Wasn't thr- I wasn't thrilled with that name. That okay. name made me a little uncomfortable. Okay, yeah. but they it was given by themselves. It's not a right. racial derogatory thing. But one guy, I don't know his name in the movie, he is in the Michael Jackson black or white video. Remember where they morph into different people in the video? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the, very, he's the smiling Jamaican guy, the Rasta guy, and he's one of the bad guys in this so in the in the jewelry store, he's the guy who gets his arm broken. He tries to oh, rape, yeah, the, yeah, rape yeah, the, yeah. the sister. That guy. So um, that guy, I can't remember his name. I'll tell you. Well, there's a lot of unnecessary boobage on that sister rape scene. It wasn't even like a rape scene. It was certainly By the not. Way, it was her, former her running Miss away. USA, former Miss USA. I looked it up. Yeah, she's gorgeous. But it wasn't a rape scene. It was like they tied her down, and you thought, uh oh, what's going to happen? But then they were just trying to do some like sort of voodoo witchcraft on her. Okay, so Seagal. Anyway, he it was a very wasn't very exciting where he kills Screwface. He cuts his head off, and I was kind of like, man, that wasn't very... That yeah, wasn't it really, seemed too early, didn't seemed it? too early, yeah. And then they hit you with that classic twist, which for some reason Seagal didn't see this coming because he talks to that one Jamaican woman, another beautiful woman who was all over him that he did nothing about, and uh, again, uh, whatever, okay. But he's talking to her about Screwface, and she says, Screwface's magic is he got two four heads eyes. She got and four, four eyes. Four eyes and two heads. And I don't, at that point, I don't know why Seagal was like, oh, he's a twin. He was just like, Ugh. I didn't get it. You didn't get it? No, I was like, what is she talking about? And like, oh, I was trying to make crazy. out her accent. And you know what? I'm the average viewer kind of half watching, worrying about my date in 1990. Is she into yeah. this movie? Am I going to get some action? Am I going to go to my place, my car? What's going to happen? Right. That's the average person. Have you ever have you ever made love to a a, a, a Caribbean woman or a Jamaican yes. woman? Yes. Let's hear about it. Let's hear all about it. Let's not. Let's hear all about it. Was it on a mission to redeem your to save your friend or anything? It was on an undercover mission, which is why I don't want to talk about it. Okay, fair enough. I used to date a girl for many years from the Bahamas. Um, they don't have as cool of an accent though. Jamaican accent's pretty cool. I would love to make love to a woman while she's talking dirty in a Jamaican accent. By the way, that girl was extremely beautiful. You're talking about the gorgeous. Oh okay, my god, she in, was like unbelievably hot. In, yeah, in, in the white dress where she was kind of dancing. Oh, she was sex, unbelievable. Sexually. Yeah, and then and her only function was to give that that clue that like, line. Yeah. yeah. So and but to that, de- and to dress sexy. Yeah. Great, great sequence. Now she was she was good, but you're right, man. The accents were just ridiculous. Like you just couldn't understand. Couldn't understand anything anybody's saying. Okay, I once got in an argument with the Jamaican guy when I was in Barbados. There was this Jamaican guy who was flamboyantly gay, but it was in like Barbados in the Caribbean. I mean, we were doing a study abroad. They don't acknowledge that people are gay there because they're so militantly homophobic. So this is like 2000 or whatever. And uh, so they would just be like these flamboyantly gay dudes from different islands, but they wouldn't be open about it. And no one would. None of the guys who were homophobic, would. they didn't realize these guys are all gay. Like they just they didn't realize it. Right. This guy. So anyway, somehow he's out with some other uh, of the American students and. 
and I didn't know him and I didn't really know them, but we all end up sharing like a cab back to the university. And me and him, I don't even understand how it happened. We ended up getting like an argument somehow about something. I don't even know how we got an argument. But he goes to me out of nowhere. No one was threatening to kill anybody. He goes, in the argument, he goes, you can't kill me, me black. <laughs> you can't kill me, me black. I was like, ah, oh, that's fucking good, man. That you is good. That is good. I was like, I'm not trying to kill you over a cab ride in fucking Barbados, but. You know, now, now, good, um, good luck with your are life. we going in an order here? Can we talk about the fact that Jimmy Cliff is in the movie? Okay, I was curious about that because I heard the Jimmy Cliff, Jimmy Cliff reggae icon. I was curious to know uh, if he was in the movie. He so was, Jimmy Cliff play? is singing the song in the in yeah. when they go to Jamaica. It's the guy on stage. Oh, and that's, that's Jimmy Cliff. That's Jimmy Cliff. Okay, and he co-wrote the song with Seagal. And in the in the song, it says here in the, in the trivia here. He go, it's screw face. You know that your time has come. You don't live right. You're going to die tonight. Come on, man. They refer, it's written for the movie. Screw face is mentioned in the song. Oh, I didn't realize that. I don't, know, song, I don't know if it's sing- in the actual, in the movie, but it's on the full song. Wow. So, okay, that's cool. That's Jimmy Cliff. Cause that was one thing I was like, once they went to Jamaica, I'm like, this seems like fucking Jamaica, you know? Now, and the, and the music's really good. Yes. And it seems like having been to the Caribbean, I've been to like quite a few islands. I'm like, this seems like one of those Caribbean towns. Like they, this is definitely, cause you know, that's what I was concerned about. Like this was going to be like a joke of like stereotypes and terribly de- like, cause sometimes you see movies where like, we're going to make the bad guys this, but we know nothing about those kind right. of people. This didn't quite seem like that. Like it seemed like, I don't know. It's well, Seagal is very respectful to other cultures. He was he studied in Japan. I remember that's why his whole thing. And then when he did the Native American one on Deadly Ground, he also, you know, really felt for that culture. I'm not he saying actually, I'm, he's he got actually, a lot of issues, but one thing is not. He's respectful of other cultures. Yeah, he actually lived inside of a buffalo, I heard, during the film. That, that. That's, that was his that, trailer. That is true. All right, so let's go through. Okay, so basically Seagal gets back, and then he kills Screwface's brother, and yada, 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 that's how it ends. Uh, let's go through the uh, individual components of the film. First of all, let's start out with guns. Guns are big. A lot of guns. What was, what was your favorite gun in the movie? Um, well, I didn't really think about it too much, but I did like where he kind of built that gun in his room when, they, when he yeah. first went back. So that was kind of illustrating the fetishism of of arms or guns. Well, he didn't movie. build a gun. He, he built did like a he built like a compass. It wasn't a gun. No, it wasn't a gun. I was wondering what the fuck he built. But he did have a little like box full of old guns next to him like as an ornament. Okay. Okay. All right. I like when he I like when he I thought you were meant where he assembled that gun in there. Let's go to Jamaica. Let's make our weapons. You know, it's hilarious. Yeah, that was a montage. I was kind of half looking yeah. at that point. That was about an hour. No, no, and a half they made in. a whole montage of them assembling guns, and the next thing you see is an Air Jamaican flight landing. You're like, where the fuck did they put all those guns? Now, you by the just way, load guns okay, on sorry. a plane. So, by the way, so at one point, I'm like, did they? Where did they film this? Right. Yeah. So then I and then I in the beginning you have Danny Trejo, and I'm like, did they fly these people to Mexico? Did they? Did they go to? And then and I'm like, oh, are they really in Jamaica? Are they in Chicago? Because it's in Chicago, right? So at one point we've forgotten. I mean, the, one of the best scenes in the movie is the is the is the car chase and the streets of Chicago, right? But at one point they're whipping down the street. There's huge palm trees, and I'm like, they're in L.A. <laughs> okay. So then I looked it up. They filmed in Chicago and L.A. Well, what about the Jamaica and Mexico? They, he never went to Jamaica. Bullshit. Never that went is to- not in. That's in L.A. Those Jamaican scenes. Yeah. All right. Well, I was going to. We're going to. By the, the way, chases. love this. I know yeah. you're a guy who likes your reggae. Yeah. I e- love Eka reggae. Mouse was offered the role of Screwface. Really? Yep. He didn't and he do turned it. it down because he didn't like how Jamaicans were portrayed in the movie. All right. I give up. Big up to him because uh, I don't know much about Eka Mouse, but I do know Dance Hall is incredibly uh, negative portrayal of virtually everybody for the most part. Yeah. Um, <laughs> There's literally a dance hall song. I think it's by Elephant Man. It's called. It's called. Uh, he's one of the biggest uh, dance hall guys for the last like twenty years. It's called like Mina. Mean. It's basically like the whole song is about how he doesn't eat pussy. He's like <laughs> Mina go downtown. Mina go downtown. Like it's like the whole song is I don't eat pussy. It's amazing. It's amazing. For some reason, he's very proud of that's that a fact. whole sub sub genre of reggae music. I don't know if you know about that. Oh yeah, no, they're all they're that's what I'm saying. They're so homophobic down there that they can't oh, yeah. even eat a woman's yeah. vagina because that's somehow gay. It's yeah. Very odd theory. Electric uh, Avenue is about that. 
What? I'm going to go down to Electric Avenue. You don't know what that means? Okay. All right. No, tell me what that means. I'm fu- I'm fucking with you, Mo. Oh, uh, that's not really that much of a Jamaican song either, but uh, okay, so yeah, I like that gum with that big silencer. It was pretty cool. Speaking of chase scenes, our next topic: great chase scene through Chicago. And but the part that I really liked it wasn't necessarily a chase scene, but it was when they backed they like backed a truck behind his car, and then the the tractor went in the other end, so they started like smashing his car. Oh yeah, he was yeah. stuck in there. Yeah, how did that come about? I'm like, where did, they probably were like filming, and they saw those like we can use that. Because it just didn't came out of nowhere. It did make sense. The Jamaicans did not seem like they were the kind of criminal organization that was going to like get construction worker outfits and get a bunch of tractors to use to ambush no. him. That that seemed out of character. But I do love that like they just had no way to write themselves out of this. Like Seagal's crushed in between those cars. He smashed in there. They light it on fire, and you're like, oh, he's going to come up with some ingenious way to get out of it. Right? No, he just fits. He just smushes himself underneath the thing and pushes his way out. It's like. But what, that doesn't make any sense. Like, he's a fat guy, first of all. He's not pushing his way out of anything. And then he was smashed in there. Like, he didn't come up with anything. He just sort of, like, squeezed out. Yeah. Uh, I was disappointed. Yeah. Uh, chicks, we already covered. The Jamaican woman definitely stole the show from me. She was gorgeous. Yeah. We should uh, look her up. Beautiful. What happened to her? Yeah, look her up real quick. Look her up. She okay. was She was hot. And then, you know, uh, soundtrack. Uh, the soundtrack was great. Yeah, I well, had no idea that Stagall co-wrote co-written, the film. Co-written by uh, Stagall. Yeah. yeah. I'm kind of surprised that Screwface never went on to act in any more films. He did he do was... a lot of stuff. Oh, he did. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good, good. Um, And then uh, one-liners, you know. Did you did any one-liners stand out to you? Well, Earl Bowen was in it, who was the doctor, who a year later would who go on. Who plays the every doctor, doctor in, in everything. Yes. Seinfeld. Seinfeld. And and by the way, the Jamaican cop who works with them, uh, he was a, char- a recurring character on Seinfeld. Oh, yeah, he was. Yeah. He worked in the in the diner. Yeah. No fucking shit. You're right. No. Um, hey, but you know what a great one liner was? Um, what was it? He goes. I gotta play it. on. Let me find it because I, I put it on Instagram. What was that fucking line? Hold on one sec. It's so goddamn funny. He's in the car with Keith David. Oh, there it is. Here it is. Here it is. He goes. Yeah, he goes. It's when he goes in there to investigate the guys, and he goes. He's basically trying to get information, right? Yeah. And in the in the scene before, he goes and gets information. He throws one guy out the window and he shoots another guy. Yeah. And and he comes back to the car and Keith David goes so and he goes one thought he was invincible. And the other thought he could fly. Right. And they were wrong. <laughs> it's amazing because that was written because they needed those quips like, you know, like uh, like Schwarzenegger. And I and, and he yeah. delivers it. If you watch it again, he delivers it. He does a whip, a whip pan to him. He's in the driver's seat. He says the first two. And then and then he kind of whips to him. and He goes, they were both they wrong. Were wrong. They, they were, were both wrong. wrong. Yeah. He does a lot of turns. He does a lot. When he's wearing that scarf, he's a lot of turns. Yeah. Well, before we go, Ben, you're, I always like to ask people if they've ever been in a fight or done anything like heroic. What's like, a, would you, is there any non-plastic gun involving heroic thing that you've ever done? Did you ever, you ever get in a fight? You ever. Not since I was about 13, 14. Let's no. hear about that. Let's hear about that. I just remember it was something to do with popcorn. And I, don't, and, I, and, I, and I I don't remember really too much about it. Wait, so something to do with popcorn. I mean, that's okay. I could see you're probably at a movie with your friends after Hebrew school and no. someone's popcorn was spilled or. Yeah, it was something to do with school with popcorn. And, and it's a buddy of mine who is still a buddy. Did you of mine. win? I don't think I did on that one. I don't think I did. Yeah. Well, if you were an action star, well, first of all, would you be a villain or a hero? You well, think? I've been a villain in many action movies. Yeah, I mean, you pretty much always play the offensive Arab villain, right? Even though you're not Arab, so it's right. even more offensive. It like right. doubles the offensiveness. Well, my parents were from Morocco, so you know. Right, right, right. You sneak in there. Yeah. By the way, if anyone's uh, listening, Benyer uh, is the the is a uh, warlord in Deadpool. Yes. Is that your name? Warlord, yeah. He gets yeah. picked up by his neck in the beginning. Good scene. 
Would you, uh, if you were like a, a hero, though, what would be your style of hero? Would you be like a Schwarzenegger hero, where you're just like a muscly guy, or would you have be like a Van Damme? Would you do like act like kicks, or would you be Seagal? Would you be like a like a kind of a quiet sort yeah, of? Yeah, I, 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 I mean, at that time in 1990, I was a little bit like Seagal. I had long hair, and I would put it in a ponytail sometimes. And you're reminding me, I did a spoof in 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 TV production class of a Seagal movie, and I cut in his action because it looked so much like me from far away so that um yeah and we really and, and i think you know he's kind of lean like i was lean you know like eh. he's a, no he's not he's fat no dude. now he is then he was lean yeah yeah you're right for a while though he was a fatty seagal came to my high uh my county fair as a kid and uh you know i never knew why he was there and he was judging the sheepdog trial and some guy uh, on Facebook hit me up to him. was like, because I was posting about Seagal. And he goes, do you remember when he came to the fair? And he goes, yeah, why was I there? He goes, he was training the sheriff dogs. Like, what? <laughs> Fuck was he doing doing that? And that was like in like the mid-90s. He really is a, a renaissance man. I mean, as he much as He really we, is, man. You he know, he really does has a lot of interests and all that. He had a reality show where he was an actual sheriff in, a, in, a, in New yeah. Orleans or something. Uh, so, interesting enough, the guy who I was Facebook with, he said, I shook his hand. And it felt like I was shaking a bag filled with bananas. I've never <laughs> heard that before. And that's a that's like a, a large hand kind of thing. I, I guess. Yeah, I he's know. a big guy. He's a big guy. So my friend who ended up doing the movie with him here, he was telling me about him. And and uh, do we have time for this, or you want to just get out of this? No, no. Let's get the story out. Let's hear it. He did these series here. I can't remember the name of the series. Um, the last few years, it was a series of movies he was doing. And this is the one that I was offered. And in the movie, he refused to come on set unless it was something where it was a close up of him. He had a body double for most things, doing action, walking around. But this is Seagal? This is Seagal. Okay. He, so he's not even doing his action scenes? No. That's very sad. Man. Okay. I mean, I feel like he's no longer in it for the love of the uh, mystical martial artist. No, he's not. And he has. Um, people hold cue cards for his lines. So he doesn't learn his lines and that's why he's wearing sunglasses a lot so that you can't see where he's, he's looking. And supposedly the, he was kind of his, he was not looking there. So they decided to get a, a buxom woman to hold the cue cards, kind of like a, like a, like a ring, <laughs> like a ring girl. <laughs> okay. So he has uh. got a ring girl holding the, the scenes and I can't remember what his name is. Can we pause? You can just edit this, right? I'm just going to pause one second. Wait, no, 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 don't pause it. No, no, I'm just pausing. It. I'm just saying you can cut this. I'm saying I'm just, I'm not going to pause ah, it. Ah, man, you always do this stuff. Hey, you know what's interesting, though? Seagal now lives over in Russia. So I, uh, I, God, and I think he's probably friends with like Putin or something. Just think about the nasty shit they're getting up to over there. Oh, yeah. You know, because, yeah, he, I've always heard that he's kind of a scumbag. Actually, how did Seagal avoid the Me Too stuff? He, he there was some he sort has of not. like, he has not. There, there's been some grumblings of Me Too stuff, but it never full blown took him down. Oh, he has not. He has not. True Justice was the series. Series. Okay. okay? All right. So they're doing uh, 25 episodes, which were like basically an hour each, and then they would make them into movies. So the one I was in was about, there was a Middle Eastern bad guy, whatever. My buddy, uh, Amir Arison, got the part. They offered me the, the main bad guy, the, which was at the end, and I didn't want to do it. So, um, so in the scene, he's doing, and he says, so-and-so Kane... <laughs> And then finally, he says while they're filming, who the hell is this Kane guy? And they go, that's you, sir. He didn't know that they had changed the because he had told him he didn't like the name. He wanted to change the name. And he had forgotten that they had changed the name for his request. So while they're filming, he's like, who the hell is this guy? Right. And they kept the line. No, they cut it out of the movie with this thing while they're oh. filming. <laughs> while they're filming, he just, like, he didn't even know what's going on. So. Isn't yeah. that infuriating? Me and you trying to be actors and shit. This guy wasn't even trying to be an actor, and he's still a fucking movie star. I mean, what do you think? He's just making these movies, and they just where do they play like overseas. Yes, he's huge in Russia and places like that. Yeah, amazing. All right, Michael. Well, I'm gonna have to have you out again soon because you know every fact about everything. This has uh, been a pleasure. I, I can't wait to hear it. And uh, it's you didn't you didn't re you didn't stop your recorder. Right? No, I, I did not to edit this. Did I'm not. not gonna edit it. You know, Seagal would want the authenticity of it. Um, all right, I'm going to give you one uh, scenario. Let's hear about a good one-liner. You just kicked, you found out Claude was sleeping with your ex-girlfriend, which, let's be honest, probably was the case. Yeah. You come in, as he's coming out of the shower, she's still naked on the bed, 
He says, what do you want? You jump, kick him in the face and say. Uh, okay, how about this? You jump, kick him in the face. You turn to her and she goes, it's you. And you say. Were you expecting someone else? <laughs> yeah. well, she's like, mean? she's like, yeah, Claude, <laughs> I, I just fucked. <laughs> I didn't right, quite thanks, understand buddy. the uh, the, the yeah, it was the it wasn't a good one. Yeah, we'll work on it next time. Can we come on? Give me a good one here. Oh, you want another one? Okay. Um, and you can edit in the actual proper one. All right, you go to you go to. I'm going to break this more like your life. You go to uh, Galanga on Santa Monica <laughs> yes. uh, with me to complain about our acting careers. Yeah. Some motorcycle thugs roar up and start robbing the place, and they yep. come up to you and they say, "What do you have? What do we have here? Couple Jewish boys eating lunch." Right. You kick him in the crotch, grab his beard, slam your knee into his face, breaking his nose, (laughs) sit back down and take a bite of your orange chicken and say, yeah, kosher style. (laughs) There we go. I love it. All right, buddy. Much love. All right. Jean-Claude Van Damme, girl. Now take your big stick and your boyfriend and find the best to catch. 